Som sagt, jag fick eh, besked eh, vid tre fikat igår att jag skulle hoppa in här. Så jag eh, har saxat lite, lite bilder från restaureringsprojekt. And my plan is to take this in uh, Swinglish. And um, <coughs> this, this is a group called Carrier of Tradition that I am my one, my one man company working together with other small companies uh, when we're into larger projects. And uh, I'm going to talk first here about the restoration of the roof for this castle in Sweden, close to Stockholm. And we were working there between 2009 and 16, doing about 9,000 hours of restoration. And uh, when I built the castle in 1655, it started. And in 1660, when I were doing the, the roof construction, there was, they were building it one piece every year, so th the people doing this was not the same. And the person called Gustav Rangel, who was the, the owner and the builder, he was the richest man in Sweden for this time, but he was pennywise, so he didn't, he used lots of farmers and the people and cheap labor, so there was lack of engineering following this project. So, for instance, this is the, the inner corner of the castle. And I don't know the word for this, Kjellsparre? Valley? Valley rafter? Uh, you see, there is no valley rafter, so the rafter is actually hanging on the color for the joint. So Therefore, the huge deformation in, in this, together with 350 years of leaking water and rot in the inner corner. So, in 1970, they put in these beams here and some ir iron clamping to actually save the roof from not falling apart. And now, 40 years later, it was really necessary to do something. So together with Carl Tillin at Triens, the construction and the castle architect and me, we were thinking about what can we do about this? Because the lack of this valley rafter, the whole roof had leaning inwards and broken the chimney, two chimneys. And there was no dragon beam in the color beam level. So all this were just ending into the chimney. So, and it's a very flexible construction. Here you can see before and after what we have put in. And uh, it was this outer, the south, the west, right, this is the east side, pushing into this frame here about six inch so everything was very much in a big tension. Very, very near to collapse. And that our design is actually taken from Architectura Civilis from 1649, where there are drawings of this. And that book was in the castle at the time when I built it, but uh, obviously nobody looked in it. <laughs> so they just cut off, when they had produced all the roof trusses and when I should put them together, they just cut them off and let it hang. And uh, now we had to lift everything up and push it out and putting in this sole. And uh, this is the half frame and this is the valley and here you see the we attached uh, the rafters to that one it was really hard to I now is there's a 
unfortunately a vacuum cleaner standing here, but <laughs> in, in the bottom here, trying to figure out how to fit this piece in, it was hard work. Here you see one of the drawings from 1649. And uh, it's about 80,000 tiles on the roof that we had to take away. And uh, this is, you, you can see the deformation here. You see the, it looks like this, where the roof, the, where the sole plate has been rut. And they changed it in 1970. But they didn't lift it up. They just let the roof trusses hanging with the tiles on the color beam. There was also, from the beginning, what were you called this in English? Dormers. Dormers, yeah. But somehow they took them away, maybe hundreds of years later. And that was actually the carpenters. We know that from from uh, documentary, that the timber men were making the roof trusses, but it was the carpenter who made the dormer. And he just cut <coughs> the roof trusses. It was that was common way to do it in Sweden and Stockholm at this time, with the disaster. You see the deformation here. And it was actually doing this so much, so the tiles were pulled apart, so the water was coming all the way bad. Here you see this framework when you have the inner, the bok, as we say in Swedish, the inner frame. And that was made by uh, pine, fir, and uh, the outer rafter is spruce. Very fast growing, very light, but it, it works as long as the roof is not leaking water. So actually there should be about one inch space here. So the outer construction actually can move a little bit when it's windy and have this inner frame as a support. But when, when they in the 1970s were fixing it here, afterwards all the pressure was on this joint. There are about 400 roof trusses all the way around. So it's lots of, and over this, this part of the castle, you have an open hall that sh it was never finished because Carl Gustav was died in the before it was finished. And it should be larger than the king of Sweden to show him that he was actually richer than the king. And there you have this more complex hanging, uh, because there shouldn't be any tie beams. Making this piece in the corner in the bottom, we had to, it's about 25, uh, 21 surfaces and angles that had to fit, and we couldn't check it until we have done them all and fit it for the first time. So it's lots of, and all these measures were just taken by eye measure and and so it was, and there you see it down somewhere there, here. And you see a mix of the 1970 repairing with big uh, stainless steel and, and so. And this, uh, we say impregnant, pregnant, impregnant, yeah. So these repairings from the 1970s will probably survive a nuclear war. So it was before we could put in this new timber, we had to push everything up and out and trying to, I mean, nothing is straight. You have lots of, you see the different in where it is. And uh, it, it was a little bit of a nightmare to, to fix this inner corner. And mostly we were working with traditional tools and methods and 
we, we were using the technique from 1660, but we used timber with so modern sawmill surfaces. These, these parts that we added, that wasn't there from the beginning, but all other parts that we were rest in the restoration, we were actually using uh, traditional tools as long as it was possible. This is the top top piece on the... So we had to lift it up and take the measures, take it down, lift up the other piece. And th this diagonal piece should fit onto the inner frame. And we tried to, to put these levers, like five of them, the largest one we could get, to around here and down to the outer end and trying to push the whole roof construction out again before we put this in. So it re really did the work that we wanted. Lifting it up. And here is the valley. And here is the, what do you say, the inner frame. So here is the, the dragon beam coming from the outer corner to the inner corner, meeting the, the valley rafter. And the constructor wanted us to put in these two so the, the force also could go all the way down to the inner corner. So now we have released the the chimney before before uh, the roof construction <laughs> was going into it so when a roof was moving in a storm the chimney was broken and it's 11 meters high you can push it with your hand and as long as possible we tried to go out in the forest close to the castle in the same way they did when I were uh, building the castle especially for the, the rafters. So this is in April. This year there was very little snow. And uh, we take th the pieces for the, the larger dimensions in, in pine. We were out in the forest winter time. And this is actually the, the pieces for the roof to get this shape. So outside the rafter, halfway down, you have this on, on the outside. And they were originally made in the same way. So we were standing there outside the castle and producing them. They're about 12 meters long and lifted in. And uh, because there was a roof over, so we we put them in on the scaffolding and then we were actually moving them <laughs> inside under the, the roof. They weighed about 100, 100, 120 kilo. Uh, here is, see you some of the repairings, the nuclear proof ones. And uh, we chose not to make the nuclear version. We made the traditional one instead. And here you see nails. These two nails are when you connect wood to wood to take these forces. And the other with very sharp end, they are for the irons to hold the, the tension that way. So the nails are actually like an anchor inside the, the wood. And we, we probably reused about 350 of these 6 to 10 inch and even 12 inch nails. And one problem with the color beams lying on top of this was that when it was storming, they were coming apart. So more or less on all these 400 roof trusses, they looked like this. You have a 
this wide gap and they were hardly doing its work anymore. So we had to take ev mo most of them and in here you have the, the, the mortar from the, the tiles underneath. So we have to take them apart and take all the gravel out and put it back again. And then we put a hand forged nail in each. Like 30% of the original had nails and they were okay. There are lots of, you, you can follow all this carpenter's marking and system and it doesn't matter which order they're coming, it's the amount. So sometimes there were, what do you say, mirror, and sometimes mixed up totally, but meaning the same. On the inner frame, we made a little note, and you can actually see that they are changing. This is the inside, and this is the outside. And you can actually see that depending on th they were building like this part of the castle this year, you can see, you can follow that the marking change with this. So it's probably different persons with different tools. And there are also lots of this red, red pencil. There is one of the inner frame where you can see that they have bought large timber which was actually sawn into two pieces. And you have these ones who are cut with hewn with X on all sides. And here is a spare one from the lower level in the castle. It's a floor, floor beam that was left over piece. So they used it for a, a brace. And you see this profile here on the side. So they, they reuse, when they come to the roof construction, they reused a lot of material. There are lots of iron work with this. And we see this in Sweden in, in this 1600 a lot. But now last week when I was in England, we saw this on the original cathedrals from 13th century, late, late 13th century and 14th century. So it was interesting to see exactly the same iron work there so several hundred years earlier. Here is an interesting, this is uh, a brace on the frame where it should be the mortise and this should be a larger timber with a tenon, but they were probably lazy because they only used small spruce pieces they had. So they have started here to making the layout with uh, first this and you have the red line and they have drilled two holes and then started with a chisel to make it and then a stop. And it's very, very rare to find something that's half done. And you can see so many stages. So th this is <laughs> really valuable to to understand which method they have. Had. It's one inch hole, I think. That was school cluster. And a little bit about using this, uh, what do you say, Julne Snittet in English? Go. Yeah. You're using, taking a timber, making a, a line, three, the same, and a 90 degree angle, and you get a, a nice beam. In, in the medieval, I, I work also as carpenter in this project with Södra Roda, where we are reconstructing a church from 1310 that was burnt down in a scientific project where we are examine and work and examine and work. And we have seen that wooden roof constructions and bell towers from, from the first half of 1100 until 1350 at the Black Plague, most of the timber are 
half timber or quarter. And we all, yeah. And we have, some of you have heard uh, Daniel, a colleague of mine, talking about this in one of the church. It's 30 meters long, and they have actually used eight pieces out of one tree to make the rafters. And then you have whole fibers, and you have this shape. And using that for strange. So when you put them up first, they have probably been standing like this. But if you pull them in and you start to put the roof boards on, then you're actually building in a, a tension that holds, holds it together. So Daniel had the opportunity and got some money to make this test project. And it's interesting when you see all this timber lying here and all this is coming from that tree. That's only made by eggs and veggies. And you see here how much it curves. And this is definitely something that modern architects could use. In, in modern constructions, I think. Another roof, almost 900 years old, still in use. A couple of, uh, like 20 kilometers from here. It's built in oak, and it's very different from all the other churches from the same age. So maybe we are looking at England, perhaps. It's very close to, to the lake, the Great Lake, Vianen here. And it, you see here, that after this struts, it shapes up and get really, it's three inches, I think. Yeah, they are two and a half by four. And you see that on the outside, you also have about one inch cut like this. So it, the outside of the roof had some kind of no, not perfect for, for strange, but uh, they probably wanted something to... And you see here, it, it's thinner here, and it gets wider and wider and wider, and then thinner again. Really, really nice. And you see the tie beam is 10 by 7, and uh, 6 by something. And you see that the, the air is definitely much more stronger in the middle. So here they have cut out for the vaulting several hundred years later. Yep. Another restoration project where we... Uh, there was a, a bell tower from 1401, so... so but in 1664, it was, it, it actually had sill from the beginning, but the sill was rotten, so they like took a strangle around it and put in three rows of large timber. And then in 1960, they put some concrete here, bad. So we had to change. So we actually had to lift up the whole tower, like 60 ton to change it. And before we had put in these braces, somebody started to ring the bell. And the whole tower started like this. <laughs> it was uh, interesting. <laughs> we didn't design this overkill uh, thing here. I think they, it was a modern constructor who really thought we should do it a little bit too much. And the sills are uh, 16, 16 by 16 inch. So we had to look for half Sweden to find the eight trees of this size. So they are, it, that was the largest pine in southern Sweden. <laughs> there are no, no larger. So neither will have to 
spend the rest of life underneath this one. And we didn't, nor it should be natural stone, but the other contractor would love Leka block. And when we were, it was hanging, so we figured out how to make all these the perfect lengths, so all these 12 legs could actually get down on the same time. So we, we took a uh, masonite and we took uh, hand saw and actually did that to all the legs so we could get it down and really knowing that it was standing good. And lots of looking at tool marks and looking how the, what kind of axis and me work methods they had used. Short movie of Jürgen banging in. I don't know if you saw it. It was really hard to put in this. Very nice. I think they are 16 inch long with a sledgehammer. And thi these cuts are very, very, you find this, it's very common that you you have sh two short nails, so you make a three-inch deep cut. He's really, really tired now. That's Speak. And while the other contractors, they didn't know how to get these big seals into the churchyard, so they were standing there calling a, a big crane while waiting, we just did this. And in 15 minutes, we told them, okay, you can cancel the crane. Cruising around the gravestones. And then we finished. A little bit about wooden buildings today. In Linköping, uh, they have a new part of the city where they have lots of new designed <coughs> roof constructions and there are lots of these exposed end of the but actually the constructor told the architects that if you're going to have a balcony like this these beams actually stops here and are bolted there because if this was going inside the building and it started to rot, there would be a problem. So this is actually built for only lasting 20, 25 years and then change the balcony if it's rotten. Very expensive, but that's design. And you have lots of big metal work that probably will have condensation behind design. And these walls are 30 meters high, and you see how they have, they didn't care about what's hard side or not, and the water will probably blow in, and I don't know what's inside here, but uh, it's open. So the, the wind and water can blow in and get on the backside. Strange, but modern design. Here is one that actually put the right side and you choose to have the top upwards. Well, feels like somebody at least tried to, to think and do something good. Here you see also that it varies what kind of boards they used. They didn't care which side to put them. And how will that look about 20 years? Here are three tired man after building this. It was also burnt down a couple of years ago and at the local museum. It was originally built in 1734, uh, 1734. And we, the insurance company said that, okay, you can get another one. And we said, no, no problem. So we actually built this building, it's, I think it's 27 meters long and 7 meters wide. 
and uh, we built it more or less with traditional tools we, without electricity. We, we could if we wanted, but we, we were too lazy to pull out all the cords. Uh, about two million Swedish. And when we were calculating on, on the estimated time, we had four hours better than the calculation for the exact calculation <laughs> that we made. about 150 square meter. Uh, what about the time? Because I have more, more to show you, but I was a couple of weeks ago, I was at the White Architects in Stockholm. I think it's the largest architect company, maybe in Sweden. And they are really, really into building new houses in wood. But when they are talking houses in wood, they are like eight, ten stories high. And it's not wood, it's a mix of concrete and iron and composite houses. No, and they, they actually had a course for educating all their architects working in wood and the constructor. So they, they are into a, a self-learning project trying to collect as much knowledge as possible. Today, here in Sweden, we have old forests left with really good timber, but everything larger than 40 centimeters, they are going to waste. They're making fire of it. They're just fleas and uh, jernvägs sleepers. Because they are too large for the sawmills. So they're wasting all this timber that started to grow in the 18th century. And it's really sad because it's pretty much because of th this industrial and, and the architects don't understand that they should use this timber instead of wasting it. We think the, the people in the US were stupid because they are cutting down all the redwood trees. We are doing the same thing and nobody does anything about it. But I asked the architects, like, what, what do you want from us? What do you want us to, to use our products? They need like this reference paper about our products and how they work and what they cost and delivery time and all this. And as long as we don't have that, it's not possible for them to use it. So, and they definitely need to get in contact with like Timber Framers Guild and, and uh, the, the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and trying, so when I were talking to them, I was showing where to get the contacts, they got all the links to Stolpark Norden and so I hope some of them at least, at least the ones, the architects who are into the smaller projects making smaller buildings could uh, use us. And, um, but it, it, I mean, I could feel that the architects are really, really they, they love wood and they want to make these nice constructions. But the industrial and the society, everybody wants them to build these big houses instead of concrete houses. So that's pretty much what I, what the time today. <laughs>